Hi, um, welcome everyone uh, to uh, Sitra's uh, third char time. Uh, I'm very uh, glad to be here again to welcome all of you uh, to our third uh, series, um, third talk in our char time series. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Tang uh, to uh, introduce uh, Sitra to all of you uh, before uh, we um, uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, Mr. Tang, please. Thank you, Navani. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, again, yeah, I can see the, some familiar faces here uh, on this uh, third uh, event uh, called Cha Tan. This is the key drinking time uh, organized by Sicha, the South, South Asian uh, Alliance of Cultural Heritage. So, um, uh, my name is Nguyen Duc Tang from the Center for Research and Promotion of uh, Cultural Heritage of Vietnam. Uh, I would like to welcome all the organizers, uh, moderators, spe speakers, and all of our audiences who are participating in this event. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the board of directors of the Southeast Asia Cultural Heritage Alliance, Chicha and Ken, for giving me the honor to welcome you all to this event. And especially, I would like to thank uh, our colleagues at the uh, Siam Society at, um, under the Royal Patronage from Thailand for making every effort for this event to be possible, as always. So, uh, about Sicha, uh, we have uh, we have been uh, on board about one year since last December. So, uh, seven, uh, seven founding members of the, uh, the organizations around uh, Southeast Asia met online to uh, announce the inception of the AHA is the uh, Asian Heritage Alliance. So it's a, this is the former name of uh, Shicha, as uh, we know today. So um, we discussed about the, our missions, uh, uh, about the objectives, the membership of the criteria and basic working procedures for Shicha. And uh, we were the seven members of the, in the, the region. So um, we were the Indonesian Heritage Trust, the Penang Heritage Trust from Malaysia, the Yangon Heritage Trust from Myanmar, the Heritage Conservation Society of the Philippines, the Singapore Heritage Society, the Siam Society under the Royal Patronate, and uh, the Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage of Vietnam. So, uh, Sicha was established uh, in with the end to be an advocacy for the ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage which was signed in Bangkok in the year 2000. Uh, we are as a non-profit organization, uh, a digital-based network of uh, South Asian civil society organizations. So we are dedicated for active uh, engagement in the preservation and safeguarding of uh, cultural heritage across the region and hopefully beyond. And uh, we are committed to uh, into a three-fold mission. First, uh, we would like to serve as a forum for robust discourse about heritage among ASEAN heritage professional practitioners, civil society and community, community organizations, and interested members of the general public. And the aim it was, is to um, promote public awareness of the importance of uh, heritage uh, protection as a vital component of national and regional sustainable, sustainable development. And the second mission is to be a think tank of a, and a research center, um, supporting ASEAN policy and decision makers in the heritage through uh, a variety of activities, including uh, research, analysis, uh, consultation, training, seminars, and conferences uh, to highlight the key issues in heritage uh, and to serve as a bridge between heritage interests and the goals of the people of businesses and governments. So CJA also gears its activities towards the development of heritage management programs in ASEAN to place cultural heritage in the heart of the ASEAN community building efforts and to join hands in bringing about creative solutions to protect her heritage sites from damaging commercialization and urbanization. So these were uh, set forth in the Vientiane Declaration. 
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, invite you to participate in this third feature. So this time we uh, have uh, another case from Vietnam. Um, so under the, common, the general theme, building climate uh, resiliency to local community wisdom. So the topic today, um, our Vietnamese uh, colleagues uh, uh, in the collaboration of uh, the uh, uh, research, National uh, Research Center for Sustainable Development from France uh, to talk about the local practices to um, strengthen resilience in Vietnam's northern upland. So this is a very interesting uh, topic. We have touched uh, different perspectives uh, regarding resiliency and uh, local knowledge. So um, I would like to wish that the discussion would come out with um, fruitful and provocative and engaging and uh, you know a good good results. So thank you very much again, and uh, we wish you uh, good health and safety. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tang, uh, for the introduction uh, to Sicha and also introducing our, um, the topic for today. As uh, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, Cha Time is a regular uh, series of uh, one hour talks. They are all free, um, and uh, this is sponsored uh, by Sicha. Uh, so we've had actually um, two other uh, Cha Time talks uh, before this. So. Um, so each child time uh, talk will feature uh, yeah, uh, practices and also, um, I guess, uh, research as well uh, from uh, CICHA members um, or rather CICHA participating uh, member countries. So uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Emmanuel Pania as well as uh, Dr. Pan uh, Fong An to uh, share your slides and you can start your talk now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Feng An, you can share the slide. Yes. Yeah, okay. So first I would like to thank the organizer of that event um, to invite us to share our research today. And it's not just a formal thanks, indeed, in fact, it is the first time that we present this research, which is an ongoing project that began in 2019. And the last field work was two weeks ago. So the data we will present today are very fresh data and it's an unprocessed reflection. Uh, we are very happy to have the opportunity to share our first result with you. And we are looking for feedback, critics and comments. And we will have time for discussion after the talk. Uh, next slide, uh, please. So you see soon a picture who show. Fungan, you can go next slide, please. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. okay. Next I again, know. yeah. So yeah, the yeah. picture you will know, see here, it's what currently happened in central Vietnam. There are heavy rain, flood, landslides that destroyed a lot of infrastructure, houses, and also killed many people. This region of Vietnam is subject to typhoons, flood, and landslides every year. But this year, the flood is considered as stronger than usual, and then they call it historical flood. And this historical flood is directly related to climate change. Because Vietnam is one of the countries in the world the most affected by natural disaster, and one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. And among all the disasters that uh, occur in Vietnam, storms and flood are the most frequent and uh, destructive. Uh, it it, it creates a lot of economic loss and human loss and infrastructural loss. Um, outside Vietnam in the world, floods are already emerging as the most widespread natural hazard on the planet. And with climate change, the, this kind of event, environmental event, will be more frequent and more unpredictable. Uh, next slide, please. So the presentation today consists on a case study which is not in the central Vietnam, but in the northern Vietnam, in the mountain area, where there is also another historical flash flood with landslide that occurred in 2018 and devastated a part of a rural commune in Vietnam Northwest Plan. So what we propose today is a qualitative study of the various responses at the local level. And we will focus on one specific kind of responses, which is changes in housing. 
and we will address in particular the role of social capital, social network and resources in adaptive capacities and resilience. So our main question are how the mutual support from interpersonal relationships helps households to recover and to rebuild the livelihood after a disaster. And in which extent social capital, which is an endogenous asset of the local community, so in which extent social capital shape resilience in face of climatic related hazard. So for the moment, for resilience concept, we took it in a very, uh, very uh, basic definition, which is the ability to absorb a shock and to recover. And we will discuss the resilience of the household and we just mobilize the case of housing restoration and changes to address the ability of the villager to absorb a shock and recover. So we don't analyze here the physical resilience of the houses. It's another topic. Um, there is a large scientific literature that argue, uh, you can come back, yeah, yeah, that in the case of coping with weather related hazard, social networks plays a primary role in adaptation and recovery. And what we want is to test this idea in the specific case of Vietnam. Because we know that in Vietnam, the interpersonal relationship, what we call quan he, is a very central dimension of the functioning of Vietnamese society. So we can put the hypothesis that in this kind of society, social capital are very important to cope with climate related other. So as you can see of this picture, we can see people who are drinking and eating together. It is a ceremony in the case of a wedding. And this kind of social event are very frequent in Vietnam, especially in the, in the Northern area. And it is social, social space interaction where people create very strong link and they also exchange many material and immaterial things. And that creates large, strong obligation and specifically obligation of support and solidarity. And that's an expression of what we call social capital. So in this paper, in this presentation, we use social capital according to the Pierre Bourdieu's definition, which is two things, the interpersonal network constituted by a web of reciprocities, obligation and trust, and regulated by norms of solidarity and mutual support. And it's also the diversity of resources that flow within the, the, this social network. So we focus on the relationship and the flow of resources. Next slide, please. So this research is a part of a bigger project, which is a pluridisciplinary research project that aims to study the impact of climate change in Vietnam and adaptation pathway. So it's, uh, the goal is to add scientific evidence to provide policy recommendation to the Ministry of Environment and uh, uh, Environmental Resources. Next slide, please. So there is many packages, climatology, macroeconomic. One of them is the package ADAPTOS, number six, it's a pa package we work to, together in it, it is the research we introduced today. And we focus on many aspects through a qualitative approach. And one of the aspects we focus on is the role of social network in adaptation strategy. So we have many fieldwork in Vietnam, but the fieldwork we will introduce today happen in Northern Vietnam in the mountain area. Please, Fongain, you can have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so I, I will uh, briefly uh, present to you our field work, our field uh, um, um, study. Uh, this is the commune of Nia Do, uh, which is uh, located in uh, Lao Cai province. You can see on the slide, Lao Cai province is uh, located uh, at the border of um, Vietnam and China. Um, and Nia Do commune uh, is, um, um, uh, um, the the Thai population is the, the majority of people in Yedo um, coming, um, and uh, if uh, I take uh, the picture from oh sorry um, it doesn't work on <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, in uh, I took um, a 3D uh, Google Earth uh, image, but um, it doesn't work on this version. So Ngedo is uh, the commune of um, uh, 
mountainous area in La Prai province, and there's uh, uh, 16 villages located in the valley, um, in a valley at an altitude of uh, um, about uh, 400 meters. Uh, there are more than 5,000 um, uh, inhabitants and um, with 100, um, 1,200 households. Um, and there's more um, in the commune, there's five um, ethnic groups, um, but um, uh, most of the people in Yedo are Thai people, um, um, up to 97%. Um, as you know, the Thai is um, the second um, largest uh, ethnic group in Vietnam uh, after the king, and they um, share um, common uh, culture and linguistic feature with the um, with um, the ethnic ethnies in La uh, Laos, Thailand, and the uh, Trang in in uh, in China. So the the um, small town of Nghĩa Đô is crossed by a national road, and um, uh, which makes um, it a relatively well connected, and especially for commercial activities, but also politically. And there's a, a important uh, market, um, <clears throat> uh, um, health, um, um, healthcare center, schools, and various uh, shops. Uh, so, in terms of uh, livelihood, um, people in Yodo, um, uh are farmers. Uh, they live uh, um, from a uh, uh, wet rice field um, that they continue, uh, they plant in the valley, and um, and also a tree plantation uh, on the mountain side, um, uh, mountain side, um, and. Uh, they have a big farming, cattle and pantry. And you can see around the house, they usually have a fish pond. Um, and around the house, they have a fruit tree. Um, but they also live um, of uh, off farm activities. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of housing, um, most people um, like um, live in a, uh, uh, steam house, wooden steam house, but uh, in the last um, 10 years, uh, there's more and more uh, concrete house. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, in 2018, uh, um, something happened. Uh, a historical um, a flat um, uh, inundated uh, the home, the, almost the whole valley. And causes uh, um, not only flash flood but uh, landslide on the mountain side. And as the images, um, we call it um, historical flood because uh, um, from um, uh, all the people, all these people from the coming, uh, when they talk, we talk with them. Uh, they said the, we never see something like that in my during uh, my lifetime. So that's flood. Um, causes uh, more than uh, 200 uh, houses destroyed, um, um, a big part of uh, infrastructures, uh, and um, uh, especially the, the, the lowest uh, part of the, the, um, um, the valley, uh, short road bridge and irrigation system, electric system, a consumption of water system uh, have been uh, destroyed. Uh, a large um, um, party of the super, uh, agricultural superficie, and um, uh, the, um, it has been uh, estimated um, um, like economic damage uh, to um, about seven um, seven hundred fifty thousand euro, um, and so uh, people life um, and. Um, daily life and activities uh, have been stopped for many uh, weeks. Um, so um, after the, this um, extreme event, uh, many uh, recovery and uh, adaptation action have been uh, conducted. Um, <clears throat> to cite some of them, um, in terms of um, livelihood, some people sick 
for Osaka agricultural job in order to compensate agricultural loss and have uh, income to repair the damage. Um, a number uh, of farmers change the uh, 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 crop system. Uh, some farmer plant corn um, because um, the rice field is buried by sand and the irrigation system is damaged um, in a large area. Uh, so they plant corn, but they also, uh, but many of them um, have a sh uh, shift, sh uh, shifted uh, to rice cultivation uh, to plant uh, uh, to plant a uh, mandarin and a uh, raising steam worm uh, for the same reason. Uh, so it's a major change that we also study in other. Um, uh, uh, in other part of, of this um, research, deeply we study deeply uh, this change because it implies a change from subsistence agriculture to a commercial agriculture, and uh, it directly connects the farmer with the global market. So some farmer develop uh, a third season um, in winter with vegetable, uh, corn, banana, etc. In uh, in terms of infrastructure, the state initiate the reinforcement of a river bank with concrete and rocks in order to reduce inundation, uh, inundation and landslide. And in term, finally, uh, in terms of housing, uh, some farmers change uh, their house, uh, houses, not only the one who uh, have their house damaged for, uh, by the flood and landslide, but also at the other. Uh, and there is uh, and in this talk, we will focus uh, on the house changes. Mm, so uh, our question are um, how farmers respond to the shock reacting to the housing practice, practices, how farmers mobili uh, mobilize uh, resources to initiate changes in the housing, how they mobilize the personal networks, uh, and in what extent does the social network foster formal housing adaptation and uh, strengthen uh, household resilience? So, Before go deep in the description of the contemporary, contemporary and recent change in housing, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want just to stress the that the importance of the damage is not only due to the force of the flood and thus to natural causes. Because we discussed with old people, and I remember an old woman from one village who was speaking about the last biggest flood that they experimented before in 1954. And she explained to us that in the past, the damage related to flood was less severe because there were fewer houses at that time and they were not located in exposed area, especially in the low place near the river as today. Also, there were more trees around the houses and along the river, which limited the power of the flow during heavy flows. So as you can see in the picture in the left hand, it is the typical way people build their houses on the hillside with a certain distance to the river. It's still the case today. But as you can see in the other picture in the right hand, uh, houses are more concentrated and more and more built near the main roads of the commune and also near the river. So they are more exposed to the flood. As you can see, there is three red houses which have been completely swept away be, be, uh, during the last flood and also very sensitive area. So there are many factors that explain the change in house location in the history. Um, first is the population growth. More people need to build more houses so they concentrate together. There is also the state policies that encourage ethnic minority farmers to go down from the mountain and to gather in accessible valley and because it's easier for the authority to manage and to control them. And there is also, of course, the economic and infrastructure development. People tend to gather near the road, near the market, near the school, etc. But as a result of what we can call the development process, houses are more exposed and more sensitive to flooding. Um, you can see here the center of the commune. In fact, it was the most damaged area of all the villages of the commune. And as you can see of, on the picture, um, this area has been developed recently, maybe 20 years ago, by diverting, changing 
the pathway of the river, the main river. So now the river do a, a form like that, but before it used to go uh, directly in the old pathway. And when the flood occurred, in fact, the river took the old pathway and destroyed all the houses and the field who was here. So we can see here a tension, maybe a contradiction between development priorities, which is develop the market, develop the road, develop the infrastructure, but also contradiction with climate change adaptation. And in the literature in climate change adaptation in Vietnam, they stress this major issue in the tension between development priorities and climate change adaptation issue. So our case is uh, an example of that. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, next again. Yeah, so total there is more than 200 houses were affected by the flood and the landslide. Um, 164 houses were low damage and 58 houses severely damaged. There are many responses at the local level. So some household decided to move their homes to a safer place is the first option. Second option, household rebuilt and hinance ruined for the house, but they stay in the same location. We also found households with low damage, only flooded, not destroyed the house, but they take the opportunity of the flood to rebuild and enhance the house, but still at the same place. There are also households with low damages, but they feel risky. They are still in a very high exposure situation. So they moved the house in a safer place. One, they move by themselves, it's a voluntary move, and others, they move because the state recommend them to move and give support for them to move. And finally, there is also some households that have been partially affected, but they didn't change anything in their home. Yes, next slide, please. So what does enhance house mean? So there is, uh, the goal is to reduce the exposure, the vulnerability to flood, and there are different options that are often combined. First is raising the foundation of the house, so they, all of them put the house higher. The second is people who change the wood one floor houses by concrete strong houses. Um, so it's to decrease, ex decrease exposure, but new, new concrete houses also correspond to the, the new urban modern standards of housing. So it's also a trend that people follow to improve that uh, living standard. And some people also rebuild silt houses. So like they used to, to, to do, do since uh, many generations in this village. Uh, so the, the stilt house has been destroyed and, and they, 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 they took the wood they can keep and they, they built a new house, but still stilt house. Uh, these stilt house are still very appreciated in that commune. And now it's very costly to have a stilt house because the wood is very scarce and very, very expensive. And when we speak with the villager, there is no consensus if stilt house or concrete house are better to cope with flood or to resist to flood. Some people consider that steel towers are better because the water can go below the house and other consider that big, strong concrete house with two floor, it's better to resist. So we, we don't know because we are not architect, but it's interesting to know there is this kind of, of different position between the villager. Um, next slide, please. So which results uh, villager use to uh, change the housing after the flood. So uh, we identified five main channels. One is the state support. The second is the voluntary contribution, or we can call that charitable donation. In Vietnamese, it's too tiet. It comes from individual or private companies uh, outside the village, and they give money, they give clothes, they give food, they give house, etc. house equipment, etc. The third channel is bank loans. The fourth channel is resources from the market. So off-farm activities or selling agricultural products to the market. And the last channel is resources from the interpersonal relationship network. So the social capital. And we estimate that the latter, the social capital contributed from 30% to 85% of the funds used by villager to relocate or rebuild or enhance the house. So now we will detail three individual cases. We have chosen these cases to show you in reality how the different resources are used by the, the villager. 
and also because they are significant of the three main trends observed among all the households that have modified their housing. Um, so the first case is Mrs. Chang. Um, at the time of the flood in October 2018, Mrs. Chang and her husband and child were living in a stilt house on the banks of the river. In fact, it is one of the three red houses I showed you before in the previous slide. So they live here with the family. So there is the older brother, the parents, they live in the same uh, land, in the same position. And during the flood, the house have been completely swept away. They lost everything, personal belongings, rice stock, chicken, ducks, a pig, personal savings, a motorbike, everything. So they decide to uh, rebuild a new house. Next slide, please. In the hills above the village. So they, they, they have a piece of land very high in the hilltop. They used to plant trees here. So they cut the trees, they put land, they, 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 they make the land more, more, more easy to build house. And the three brothers uh, 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 built their house here. As you can see in the picture, this family, Mrs. Chang family, they decided to, to build a concrete house. They used to live in a steel house and now they have a concrete house in a one level. Uh, so uh, this place is good because it shows there will not be flood because it's very high, but they are still exposed to very big wind storm uh, that often occur here. And they are scared that the, 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 the house, especially the, uh, you say the, 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 the top part of the house is, is destroyed by the, the, the storm. So they still feel not completely comfortable. And there is also some, um, some, uh, uh, um, Tombs right near, right next to the door, and the wife uh, shared to her that she's very scared to live here because it's uh, near ghosts and near bad people, etc. So, in fact, they are not very happy about the position, but they have no choice because it's the only land available in this family to build a house in the safe place. So, next slide, please. So, to finance the change of the house, they have support from the state. The state give more than $800 for all the households who have been swept away. They give also eight, more than $8,800 as a grant for the, from the district level to move the house in the safer place. They get also $1,200 from Tultien, charitable donation, voluntary contribution by individual companies outside the village. And they also received uh, rice, 20 kilo, and clothes. They also borrow money. So they borrow money from the, the wife's uh, mother. They also borrow uh, $2,300 from the social policy bank with a preferential rates loans for poor households whom house have been swept away. They have to pay uh, during 10 years, 0.55% uh, uh, each month. Um, they also bought a lot of material on credit to build the house and they rent the service of an excavator machine to prepare the ground foundation, but they don't pay directly. They keep the debt and they will pay later. Uh, Mrs. Chang also said to us that they don't have money to rent a worker to build the house. So they build the house by themselves. The husband is a builder, so he has the capacity to do it. And except for the roof, they paid three workers during one week to, to build the roof. And they also use free labor from a close relative, so from the social network, to build some specific uh, difficult work for the house. Um, so the total cost of the house for them was two thousand five hundred dollars, but the real cost, if they have to pay for everything, is thirteen thousand dollars, and they get around uh, eight thousand dollars from various support. So eight thousand dollars, it's uh, uh, twice more than the price of the house. But we have to remind that during the seven months they build the house, they have to stay in the village, stay, uh, build the house, and they cannot have any income. So they use also the money from the support, from the bank, for the daily uh, expense. So as we can see, this household combines the different channels to access to resources. But the formal and informal credit remains the main way to recover. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so they, they, just before to change to the other case, I just have to say that the husband, after finishing to build the house, he continued to work around the commune as a builder to get money. 
but the wife said the, the, the money from daily worker, it's not enough to, to repay, to pay back the debt. So she has to go work in the south of Vietnam during seven months in a company with her sister to get money to pay back the debt. But after seven months, she cannot bear this job anymore, very difficult job, she, she, she work a lot. So she came back to the village. So we can see the strategy for them, it's to seek for offer an agricultural job to pay back the debt they use to build the house. So the next case is Mr. Bill, completely different case. Uh, he's a king, a king, a king people. So he's not a Thai, a, 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 a local a minority uh, ethnic group, but king people is a majority group in Vietnam, the Viet people. So they come from the Red River Delta and 20 years ago, they, in, they settled in the commune because the wife of Mr. Bing was a teacher and she teach in this commune. And now she's a director of an elementary school in a neighboring municipality. So the husband, he used to be soldier. He used to be meat trader. He worked also in a road construction company. And now he just stay at home and don't work anymore. They used to live in a stilt house, but during the flood, they lost all the house and they decide to rebuild, next slide please, a two floor concrete house in a higher and stronger foundation. As you can see on the picture, the house is uh, elevated and the husband said to her that this house can cope and withstand if a future flood of similar intensity occur again. The total price to build this house is uh, $30,000. Uh, next slide please. So they also combine many kind of supports. There is uh, $3,000 from voluntary donation, more than $800 from the government to uh, people who lost the house, also value state support, but they get a lot of money from uh, the, uh, lot of money also from the, um, the gift and the personal uh, network. Uh, as you can see, there is $2,000 from teacher and colleagues of the wife school. Um, also, $6,500 from the wife's three brother. They said it's land money, but in fact, the husband told her that they are quite rich, so they will never ask uh, more money. Uh, they get also uh, land money from the bank and also the policy banks with a preferential rate interest and also money from a commercial bank thanks to the wife's salary. So as you can see in this case, they can mobilize a lot of resources. The last case, next slide please, is Mrs. Ling, was born in 1968. She was divorced three times and she has no children. She's quite poor. She lives al alone in an old house on stilts. And her house also have been not swept away, but strongly destroyed. And she lost also her, her personal belongings. So after the flood, uh, she received from the government uh, also the money from the people who have to move the house because the government recommend her to change the house location between be, because it is in a very risky exposure location. So as you can see, they, she get money from uh, the, the, the charitable donation, um, also money from the state, and she gave everything she get to her brother. And in fact, her brother take care of everything for her. He give piece of land, he build a new house, and he asked to his personal network to help him to build the new house. So next slide, please. As you can see, there is a large diversity of uh, situation. Uh, th that's in the picture is the house of uh, Mrs. Lin. Uh, next slide again. So one extreme of the, yeah, one extreme of the spectrum, you have people with very low social capital and mainly, and they mainly rely on state and material support of the close relative to, uh, to restore the capacity. It is a case of Mrs. Mrs. Ling, and she doesn't have the capacity to reciprocate. So in this situation, where there is a strong obligation to give back, if you cannot give back the support you get, people will help you, but they cannot help you a lot. It is a case of this woman. The second case, the opposite, uh, the opposite of the spectrum, uh, is household with highly developed social capital, and they can, raise large amount of money by combining gift and loads from relative. It is the case number two of Mr. Bing, which is a king with a lot of connection, a lot of relation in the village, outside the village, in many places in Vietnam, and he can uh, raise a lot of money. And between these two extremes, there is a lot of households who combine 
they jungle with the resources from the state, from the personal network, for the, for, for, from the private donation to try to restore. So next slide, please. As uh, you can see, the respective share of resources provided by the social network varies significantly according to each case. But social capital is still very important for recovery. Sometimes it allows a basic recovery, but it doesn't resolve the, the structural vulnerability. Other case, it can give people the capacity to restore good living condition. And in other cases, it fosters sustainable adaptation strategy. But you have to keep in mind that most of the support is debt. They have to pay back. It can be gift, bank, personal debt with people of the networks, but they have to give back. So I think the main function of social capital is not only to provide resources, but it's a way to spreading out expenses over medium or long term. So it is a system based on debt and reciprocity. Thank you, uh, Fongan. It's uh, for you now, for the conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in this part of the research, uh, we, we question about the role of social network in housing changes and in resilience to natural hazard. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, does this, um, does uh, the capital, um, uh, social capital sell then housing and people resilience? Um, the, 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 our first answer is the social capital contribute mainly to the reconstruction uh, of uh, basic material conditions. And it is really crucial for recovery periods and can help in building adaptive capacity. Um, however, it doesn't help to resolve the underlying driver of vulnerability, uh, vulnerability. Uh, why? There's some limits of um, using social capital to deal with um, uh, uh, to, to cope with um, natural hazards and disasters. Um, um, uh, firstly, um, oh sorry, um, we uh, <clears throat> there's a, the people are not equal um, to the same. Uh, um, uh, resources when they mobilize the social capital, uh, as you can see in the three cases. Um, and uh, the, use, the use of uh, social capital uh, can be limited when everybody is impacted by a, a big uh, disaster. Um, the, another problem is uh, um, the responsibility uh, um, of the state, we can question about this. And in um, this case and in the other case, uh, we eat this in the, the, the uh, just uh, recently in the center of Vietnam, is that uh, people have to rely on uh, charitable donation. Um, and so uh, we can uh, question about the role of the state. Uh, finally, um, there's a limit of um, the adaptation policy which, uh, which focus uh, on exposure um, uh, reduction uh, without addressing uh, the structural uh, vulnerability. Um, so um, we don't uh, really have information um, uh, of uh, uh, the type of housing, uh, like a traditional wooden scene house um, or the concrete house that resist better to uh, uh, to uh, some kind of um, uh, some type of hazards like flood, landslide, or storm, uh, and there's a, a lack of, of um, a systemic approach to build the community uh, resilience. Um, 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 it consists in defining the factors that increase the intensity intensity of hazard. Um, in, in building the early warming system uh, and training people to, to use it. For example, when it rains uh, in the upstream area, uh, the people in the downstream uh, need to be warm um, you know, to prevent the, the floods and landslide. Um, and finally, people are not prepared to face the uncertainty in the context of climate change. 
so they do like individual actions uh, mostly and uh, we don't know if really uh, um, if their houses uh, uh, will uh, resist uh, uh, or future shock because we never know or what can happen with climate change. And so I uh, would like to in invite uh, Dr. Emmanuel to, um, <laughs> to open the discussion. Okay, so as you can see, social capital is necessary to restore and to rebuild. So it's very important. It can help adaptation, but it's not sufficient. And it's also good for idiosyncratic shock. But if everyone has been uh, affected, they cannot use the resource from the community. Um, so the question I want maybe to discuss with you uh, uh, is uh, the social capital. Is it only an ex post risk coping strategy? So just a response after the disaster to cope with risk and uh, related climate hazard, or we can consider social capital also as an adaptive strategy. And the second question is in this condition, um, can we speak about resilience and adaptation in this case on only absorption, restoration, but not long-term adaptation? And the last question also would be in which extent uh, can we consider that social capital is a part of the local heritage, immaterial heritage? Um, it's also a, a question we, we want to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pania and Dr. Fong. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, Dr. Fan Pan, sorry. Uh, this is so interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, participants have questions. If there are questions, uh, please use the Q&A button. You can uh, leave your questions there. Uh, but just to um, kick things off while people are thinking about uh, comments and questions and feedback uh, they have for you. I really like uh, you know, your last slide with a number of uh, thinking points, thinking questions, uh, especially the, the question about heritage and the role of uh, heritage in, in um, I guess, resilience. Uh, in this context. So um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Pena and Dr. Pan, uh, your thoughts about actually um, the, the possibility of, uh, I mean, uh, when there is, um, uh, do you think that there is, when there is actually good, uh, you know, um, uh, community interactions, uh, you know, vibrant heritage networks uh, in the community, uh, do you think that that may be something that helps to strengthen the kinds of social capital uh, that we see is so necessary uh, in recovery? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. But yes, what, what we observe in this commune, there is 16 villages and every time when we go to one villages in one household, uh, and when they speak about other villagers, they say, yeah, this one is my, uh, is my cousin, this one is my uh, daughter-in-law, this one. So when we speak, all of them seems to have uh, personal links. It can be kinship, it can be uh, alliance with marital protection, it can be neighbors, but it's very strong links. And mm -hmm. in fact, there are a lot, lot of local events like ceremony, festing, mm -hmm. but it's not Sometimes it's a lot. It's very expensive to organize this event. And each time people gather here, so of course they drink together, they eat together, so they build a link, but they also make a lot of exchanges. And these exchanges are reciproc. And reciproc, it means they build very strong obligation. And we, we see that this obligation, it's in the daily life, when you need to organize a wedding, a funeral, a new house, etc. But they also use this network, this community link, when they have a shock, when they lose buffalo, when they get sick, when some, mm -hmm. someone dies in the family, or when natural hazard uh, occur. So we, we, yeah. we, we can say for sure that the local community links are very strong in the daily life, and they can use this obligation and network when something happens, so to strengthen the resilience but mm. it's, it's still limited. So in the context where there is few state resource, the mm. resource from private donation are not allowed in the mountain. It is in fact the, one of the, the, the only way they can have resources. So it's, it, it's quite important, but we still yeah. need to consider that 
it cannot foster long-term resilience and it doesn't act mm. in the structural vulnerability of the of the mm. household yeah yeah, yeah uh, thanks for that but i mean for me uh, it was really insightful because uh, i i worked in i mean i am in the singapore heritage society where we often question or are questioned you know what is the value of heritage but i think this work really shows uh, one of the underlying of uh, actually heritage um, is that it has this uh, ability to create uh, meaningful connections between cultural communities within people in um, these communities and that is so important uh, in terms of building up uh, social capital. Um, there is a question uh, that's coming through uh, actually it's just nice that you ended on that note on vulnerability. So this question is about the underlying drivers of vulnerability. So the question is, um, is it not in a way surprising that in a country known for having a strong government uh, and where planners are certainly well aware of the risks to constructions in low-lying areas, uh, yeah, people were allowed to build houses in areas exposed to floods. So uh, I guess this has to do with, um, yeah, I mean, I guess why uh, people were allowed to uh, kind of build these houses, yeah, that were vulnerable and exposed yeah. to floods, yeah. Uh, you want, I begin to answer, Fungai, or you want to answer? Yeah, you, you, you can go first and then I, I may add okay. some ideas. Okay, okay. So f first, yes, Vietnam has a strong government and a lot of technical capacity, but we are still in the mountain area. And in this place, of course, the government is here and manage and uh, advise the people, but they don't manage everything of the daily life. Um, they, 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 they cannot directly act where they put the house. So there is recently, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, there is recently a law that uh, forbids people to build a house in, um, we, we, we call that uh, uh, mountain or, or forest land. So it's not land for a house, it's land for forest. So before they have the land and they can do what they want. They want to build a house here, 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 they can do what they want. So recently there is a new law that say, okay, if you want to build a house in the forest land, you have to change the status of, of the land, and it's difficult to do so. But it, it, it's just a law. Uh, in the reality, uh, when there is a new household who, who, who get married and they want to have their own house, so they get a piece of land of the father and the mother, and they, do, uh, they, they can do what they want. But what can the government do, and they do it since long time, it's that when they see a house that already exists in an uh, exposed area, they advise and recommend, and it's not only new after the flood, it's occur every year. They go to the village with a professional of land and slide flood, and they said, okay, this house, this house, this house is exposed. So please move your house in the other place. So they cannot force the people, but they give incentives by giving money. But the money the government gives to move the house is never enough to pay all the move. So that's why some mm. people, they follow the recommendation of the state and some mm. people, uh, they do not. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, actually, there is a um, question or rather more of a, su a, a suggestion here. And um, perhaps you could, uh, I, I guess, uh, discuss your thoughts about it. Um, yeah, this, this question comes from uh, Thi Bin Min Hong. Uh, and uh, the suggestion is uh, having a stakeholder meeting or discussion Right, uh, I guess it's about multi-stakeholder uh, deliberation uh, that can uh, address the solutions reg with regards to uh, the problem of uh, natural disasters. Yeah, and uh, the importance of uh, actually increasing and empowering local communities with the awareness as well as uh, knowledge uh, about this work, this research. So I, I guess related to this, um, suggestion uh, my question is how uh, you do you think uh, you know um, the research can be translated into something that 
would uh, impact uh, the local local governments as well as local communities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Fungain, you want to say something? Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's very interesting, and uh, but um, uh, I think our uh, research, uh, nature of our research is um, uh, there's a part of um, uh, policy uh, uh, advocacy also, but for the first part, um, we try to to describe on the reaction and to see what happened. Uh, before you know uh, doing this kind of so we we see uh, people sometimes we uh, we conduct a uh, group um, interview but uh, for the first step uh, we just try to see what what people did after uh, the disaster uh, mm -hmm. and then we may see other um, uh, other people to cross the information you know uh, I think the, the second one, uh, the, the, the question concerned maybe um, um, the practical significance of the research or the, the second part of, uh, you know, uh, which related to the uh, advocacy, um, uh, policy advocacy. And we, mm -hmm. we are not up to that. But uh, to, in order to respond, to, to answer the, uh, the significant, uh, um, um, the, Practical significance. We first have first to see uh, what is the reaction of the people and what people think about, uh, you know, what they do. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Can I add something, Mrs. Pan? Yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, so thank, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, this research is a part of a bigger project that I, I, I introduced very briefly in the introduction, which is GEM project. And GEM projects, they cross climatology, macroeconomic, macrosociology, and qualitative cases to address directly the issue of climate change impact and adaptation to the Ministry of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, and especially to a specific unit which work about climate change uh, issue in Vietnam. So our strategy, it's not directly to act in the village because we are not we are not, uh, I think it's not a responsibility to act only in this uh, village, but we do many case studies, not only here, also in the southern Vietnam, we'll do also in the central Vietnam, and take some lessons, some understandable from the ground, what happened in many places, to report from the authority at the higher level, and to design with us and to support them also to take decision. Because in Vietnam, there is a strong government, as you said, they take decision, but sometimes they cannot take the diversity of the situation mm -hmm. according to it. So what we want to do is to show, okay, in this place, the issue is like that, like that, like that. So maybe the policy should be specific to this area. In this place, like that, in this place, like that. And also cross data from climatology, from economic, to support our analysis. So the way we want to support them is, uh, is uh, more structural and uh, working directly with the government. And at the end of the question, there is also the issue of planting trees. And it's very interesting. We don't have the time to speak about that, but it's also related to policy. In fact, one of the main reasons of this big flood is that upstream, since long time, people uh, cultivate the hill, the forest, and the mountain. And mm -hmm. because they cultivate here, there is erosion, and it creates landslide. And the landslide stops the river, so it creates a dam, the water goes up, and when it's broken, all the flood go and destroy everything. So one of the origin reason is at the upstream, the way uh, land use here. And there is also in Vietnam very strong policy about the way to manage forest and mountain. But of, of course, the way to be sure that there is rough restoration could be a good way, not only to act after the disaster, but to act right. at the beginning to uh, mitigate the possible uh, risk. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there is uh, no question. Yes, uh, we're aware of the time, but there is a uh, one more question. Uh, so I understand that yeah, your your role here is more to work with directly with the governments. Uh, but just wondering, uh, in response to the question, uh, to your knowledge, uh, yeah, immediately following the flood, uh, were meetings held with the communities to. I guess uh, mobilize around issues not just about housing but also 
uh, other issues like food supply, water, and so on, like general issues associated with the disaster. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't have the time here to speak about that, but it's a very important issue. We call that the emergency intervention. And mm -hmm. just after the flood, there is a mix of the local community that support a lot. To, uh, they give food, they give rice, they give house, they help to, to clear the house. And also people from other communes, the police, the army, the uh, farmer organizations, the women organization. Um, so there is a very strong support immediately after the flood from the local mm -hmm. community, from the local authority, from the neighbor's commune, also the student of the school to uh, help people to clear up and also to get food, to get uh, home, to get clothes. So, so we can say, if we compare in other country, like for example, in West Africa, uh, that the state is quite efficient for the emergency intervention. And uh, also the local community, it's, uh, everybody has a home, everybody has rice, everybody has meat after. So they are not in the situation, they can, uh, they can die because of, of no food or everything. So, so of course, yeah. a part of the social capital is not only for the housing, not only for the adaptation in the middle term, but just after it's very strong and important. But it's yeah. still after the disaster. So how can we mitigate before it's also an important issue? Yeah, indeed, not just like uh, resilience. Uh, yeah, you know, in the context of recovering after a disaster, but also defensive kind of resilience um, to avoid a disaster in the first place, right? Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Penia and Dr. Tan. Uh, yeah, we promised to end within the hour. It's, it's slightly past the hour, but I'm, I think we are all okay with that. <laughs> So uh, I just want to invite everyone to thank, um, to join me in thanking uh, both of our speakers today. I learned a lot and it really set me thinking about that, uh, you know, the, the ways by which we can think of about uh, cultural heritage as well as uh, climate change. Um, so I want to uh, thank you both uh, Dr. Tanya and Dr. Pan for uh, the wonderful presentation. Thank you all for the questions that came through as well. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next trial time. And thank you thank also, you uh, thank you Natalie huh, also for the discussion and for uh, organizing the, the discussion. And thank you a lot also Mr. Tang who invited us and uh, Jeremy yes. and all the committee of organization. Thank you a lot. Huh? Thank, you. thank you, thank you, bye. bye.